Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Deborah, Rhonda. I saw some names. I think I saw Tanya. Leticia, good morning. So, how's everybody doing this Sunday? Morning for me. <laughs> it's a, probably, what is it, mid morning? Uh, I gotta get up earlier. Hi, Michelle! <laughs> Let's start by pulling a, a self help dispenser. Take a ticket, get an answer. Good morning. Good morning, Linda. Let's see what our self help box says today. Oop. Oh, this is a good one. Good morning, Mom. Hey, Nina. <clears throat> Look for the you in Guru. Don't let anybody else be your authority. Uh, it looks blurry. Look for the you in Guru. Gurus are dangerous. Good morning, good morning. Yeah, be your own guru. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Housekeeping stuff real quick. Hi, hi, hi! Um, because the reading is pretty uh, intense as most of them are, as we find out. So, Monday, just a reminder, two copies of this giveaway. Uh, for people who are present, I'll be putting people's names in a randomizer. And, um clicking a button and the randomizer will tell us who wins two copies of this book. Excellent book to carry around in a car. It's pretty small. My hands are, are large, so these are about seven inches long. But it's nice. It, it's thin. It slips into your purse really well. And it's good reminders to carry around during the day when you're stuck in traffic or doctor's office or whatever. You are sunshiny yellow today. You've not been yellow before, I don't think. The yellow's nice. I don't think the yellow gets... Maybe you're special. I don't think the yellow gets handed out very often. Um, the other thing coming up before we dive in is a Desire Map Workshop. The next one starts... I have one going now, and the next one starts October 20th. But listen closely. The ticket sales end October 10th. So that's next Saturday... Um, I have to cut them off about 10 days before the classes start because I mail out, um, I mail you out a hard copy of the workbook that we use to go through. You get essential oil samples because we use those. You get a notebook, um, some cards for artwork, and you can check that out here. It's Tuesday nights, 8.30 to 10 Eastern Time. It's just a call in, so you don't even have to get dressed for it. Five weeks of awesome dot eventbrite dot com. Hi Catherine. Next is our map workshop. Five weeks of awesome dot eventbrite dot com. Uh, the price is two hundred lower than the other. Oh, you're we're just doing housekeeping stuff. So you haven't missed anything. Um, Catherine's taking the workshop. My mom's taking the workshop. She's on her second trip through. Um, <clears throat> the price will go up in January. Yeah, no, you're totally fine. So, five weeks of awesome.eventbrite.com. It's desire mapping with essential oils. And you get all that stuff in the mail. But tickets end, ticket sales for this round end October 10th. So, I have time to mail stuff to you. And there are only 11 spots left. And it's, you don't have to have read the book, but this is the book it comes from. But here's the thing. This book and the workbook are our starting point, but you get a lot of individual, in-depth coaching from me. It's Awesome gave me the courage to retire. Woohoo! Yay! <laughs> yeah. So you get coaching. Like, I coach you. You pick your core desired feelings. You pick your goals. Twelve. You're the first. Michelle's the first sign-up. <laughs> I keep them small so we can do in-depth coaching with you guys so when you pick a goal and you pick a feeling that you want and then we start digging into um what's stopping you it was so helpful for me to go through the workshop i'm so glad i'm so glad the first couple of weeks you're like what is happening and then third fourth and fifth weeks you just get blown away 
helps to focus on your true desires and figure out why you might be preventing yourself from reaching your goals or preventing yourself from feeling the feelings you say that you want to feel. So lots of in, intense coaching in those workshops too. You like to be the first. You are the first. <laughs> okay. Book giveaway. Desire Mac workshop. Now, um, and then uh, let's get going on our reading. But also just a reminder. My, what a lovely mala I have. I'm so glad you noticed. <laughs> I can wear it today because my hair's not wet. And remember to look for the you in Guru. Test everything out for yourself. You Keep what's useful, toss the rest away. And don't listen to anybody and go against your own inner judgment. Because all of us are teachers. Okay, so today the reading comes from the text, which is where the wording is the most complicated. <laughs> I wish you guys could hear the... I know you can kind of hear the sound. Things are louder on the other side, but the sound of them clicking together is pretty cool. Oh, yeah, there's the website, caddyshackdesigns.com. I had all kinds of things to babble about. Okay, let's get down to the reason you probably showed up. Uh, chapter 12 in the text, verse 3, section 3 and 4. Oh, darn it. They're singing to me, yes. Clickety click. Rhonda, that's horrible. This is the first day we've had actually decent. Oh, it's so frustrating. Okay. This is talking about judging others and spending time and analyzing other people's behaviors, which uh, almost 99% of the time we're entirely wrong about. <laughs> We might have an idea of why people are doing what they're doing, but unless we've asked them and let them explain themselves, we don't truly know. And making those assumptions gets us in lots of trouble and can lead to analysis paralysis where you spend all your time. So the question, Rhonda, would be is why analyze in the first place? Something to consider. Like, uh... If you want to know someone's motives or be, uh, why they do what they do, um, ask them if you can. Oh, you're Libra. <laughs> okay. Um, so these are the two lines that came out of the book, Holy Shift, that we use as our starting point. Every loving thought is true, without a doubt. Everything else is an appeal for healing and help, regardless of the form it takes. So we know a lot of adults act out their need for help in toddler-type behaviors, or worse, or with guns. Um, so let's read this here quick. You have been told not to make error real. And the way to do this is very simple. If you want to believe in error, you would have to make it real because it is not true. But truth is real in its own right. And to believe in truth, you don't have to do a thing. Byron Katie would say the only thing you have to do is stay in your own business. Your business, their business, God's business. Stay in your business and your simmering, soaking marinating in your own connection to source and then that lets everyone else take care of themselves understand that you do not respond to anything directly yeah but to your interpretation of it okay this is the storytelling it always comes back to the storytelling we're not responding to the facts of most events we're responding to our story about those events let me give you a quick example when I used to work at a place with uh, juvenile boys in a rehabilitation center for drug and alcohol and criminal kids, kids involved in the criminal justice system, um, we had two floors of boys aged 13 to 21. Uh, it was a hell of a job. <laughs> but I lived in Fort Collins, Colorado at the time, and I rode my mountain bike everywhere because Fort Collins is like Portland. It's like the most bike-friendly city ever. So I'm riding 
and I'm screwing around, and I'm riding off the steps of the building. So there's like maybe five or six long, flat, concrete steps from the front door of the building down to the parking lot. And that's a good... I was mountain biking a lot at the time, and that's a, gr- a good way to practice your downhill is to ride downstairs. So I'm riding down the stairs, and I biff it at the end, like on my third time. I did make it successfully through a couple times. <laughs> but the third time down, I totally biff it. I go over the handlebars. I land like this on the parking lot. It wasn't like permanent damage. And I had sunglasses on, so the sunglass took the hit, and my eye was fine. And But I had bloodied up my knee and my elbow. And, you know, I, at, at that time... Uh, when you're doing a lot of mountain biking, it's a painful sport. So you just kind of get used to it. Um, so I was fine. Like I was a little shaken up and the, the boys were like, Oh my God, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm fine. And, and then they were like, that was awesome. You know, cause there was blood going everywhere. So my perception of the event was, Hey, I made it through twice. And the third time I biffed it, big deal. I'll go wash the blood off, patch myself up and I'll ride home. No big deal. Um, Unfortunately, actually, I was more upset about, well, <laughs> I was more upset about my sunglasses because they were expensive. So I go upstairs. I'm sitting in one of the other counselor's offices, and he says, oh, my God, you must have been so embarrassed. And I looked at him, and I was like, embarrassed? Why would I be embarrassed? I wasn't embarrassed. Um... I was happy I made it through the first two tries before I ate a little asphalt. I wasn't embarrassed at all, Daniel. So his interpretation of the event is how he would feel had he biffed it in front. Yeah. If he'd have biffed it in front of all the boys, he would have died of embarrassment. And I was like, my only focus was my lost sunglasses and the fact that I successfully did it twice. So that was a skill building exercise for me. But in that moment, it was like such a strong moment, I'll never forget it, that such a strong example of the different interpretation of events. Oh, good. Yeah, it's a good sport. I haven't been doing it lately, um, and I need to. And the importance of checking it out. So another way he could have handled that is to say, how did you feel? How are you feeling? Are you, you know... How'd you feel when you, like, biffed it right in front of the kids? I would have been like, okay, um, fine. They think it's cool. <laughs> they like blood because <laughs> they're, they're horrible children. That's why we work with them. Um, but instead, of he went to the assumption part. He assumed that I must have been just utterly mortified at what happened. So that's what I mean. Like, if you, you need to check things out with people first. You need to ask before you offer advice, you need to ask to see what they feel. Sometimes you're picking up something from someone if you're intuitive. And if you're on this call, you are intuitive. Good morning. If you're an intuitive person, a lot of times you'll pick something up. But you might not necessarily know where it's coming from. So you'll pick up the sense of something Great story. On my Facebook, I have a quote I wrote about other people's perspective, like an aha. I'm going to have to go look. And you guys, if you're not following me on Facebook, you're totally welcome to. I have a gift for you. We like gifts lately. You get lots of gifts. I will um, DM you on Twitter if your Twitter handle and your Periscope handle are the same. TarotLifeCoach at gmail.com. Hero Life Coach Gmail. Got it. Okay, so ask. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> and gifts are fun. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, so the analysis of ego motivation is very complicated, very obscuring, and never without ego involvement. The whole process is a clear-cut attempt. Oh, nice. Grace and gratitude. Let's try and live our day that way, Grace with grace and gratitude. The double G approach to daily living. <laughs> uh, 
there is but one interpretation of motivation that makes any sense, and because it is the Holy Spirit's judgment, it requires no effort at all. Every loving thought is true. Period. Everything else is an appeal for help, regardless of the form it takes. Can anyone be justified in responding with anger to a brother's plea for help? We're not ever, unless it's, I mean, okay, let me say this. There's righteous anger, and then there's anger because a request for help is triggering something in you. Righteous anger is when you have to set a boundary. Someone's trying to grab your purse. Someone's trying to hit you. Someone's trying to hurt you emotionally or whatever. You set that righteous boundary. You plant your, you know, your emotional sword in front of you and you say, uh, no, absolutely not. That's different. That's like a clean, a clean, burning, righteous anger. The other anger is dirty in the sense that it's complicated with your fear. So anger complicated with fear is muddy. Um, Clear-cut righteous anger is a survival skill. So there's a little bit of a fine line there. No response can be appropriate except the willingness to give it to him for this and only this is what he's asking for and that's love. That doesn't mean you give people your last dollar. It doesn't mean you sacrifice yourself to save the whiners around you. Because there's a lot of whining, and there's a lot of victim stuff, and there's a lot of people that will pull on you to lift them up. Including people who pose themselves as gurus. Slash narcissists. Um... If you believe that an appeal for help is something else, you will react to something else. If you believe that an appeal for help, if you believe your story about the appeal for help, you're reacting to your story, not the truth. The truth is a request for love, and you can send anybody love in any moment. Honestly, that's sometimes the most powerful thing you can do is get in a place of compassion for yourself first and then get in a place of compassion and love for the other and radiate that. Just like a heater radiates heat. Just like, I was talking to my sister last night, it's just like when you're happy, you radiate happy and the people around you have a choice then. They can be triggered by your happy energetic field into happiness of their own or they can get pissed off. And if you maintain your field of happiness, they go away. You can send anybody love at any moment like the driver that cuts me off. Oh, the driver. You can send the driver love. We are love vibrators. Well, that's interesting. (laughs) Instead of the finger, I send love now. We are love vibrators. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I had a naughty moment. (laughs) Uh, if you are responding to the truth (laughs) if you're responding to the truth you're never going to get it wrong if you respond to the story about what you think is happening you can easily get it wrong and then you've got more problems on your hands Uh, let's see what else pops out. It is surely good advice to tell you not to judge what you do not understand. If you are unwilling to give help and to receive it, you can't perceive it accurately. Deny him your help and you will not recognize God's answer to you. Okay, what that means is not that you're a bad person if you deny someone's help. But energetically, you can't receive the answers to your prayers if you are busy judging and storytelling about other people. And why is that? Because you don't match. To receive, remember Martha Beck says all your, all the things that you want are on Peace Street. 
So hard not to assume when it is so automatic sometimes. Yes, it, it's automatic because we're human and it's our human brain's driving need to analyze our environment to make sure we're safe. So if we're spending a lot of time analyzing, underneath that analysis is fear. Because we're afraid that something's going to sneak up on us and grab us without our being aware of it. So we analyze. Respond to your heart's knowing, not your mind's story of self-protection. Yeah, and it takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of practice. So if you're like a controlling person to the point that it makes you and other people insane um that's a deep fear yeah that's a good one um your heart knows the truth and the truth is love or fear and the deeper truth is you get to choose So if you're caught up in analyzing what other people's motives are, it's coming from a place of fear. Because here's the thing. If you knew 100% that you were so skilled in taking care of yourself that absolutely nothing would ever be denied to you, you'd have no reason to fear other people. We ultimately go to our primal fear, and that is that we're going to die. Someone's going to kill us, or we're going to do something stupid, and we're going to die. So most fears stem from fear of annihilation. So you get an ego response of deep, deep fear, because um, we have that fear of death. Death is not the worst thing that can happen to us feels like it is and our body will fight it because that's what it's designed to do so don't beat yourself up if you make assumptions or if you're analyzing your environment all the time respond to that tendency with love and compassion because it's coming from fear it's coming from a sense of you not understanding that you are so powerful that things can harm your body but nothing can harm your soul Nothing can separate you from your connection to source except your own mind. Nothing can separate you from source except your stories and your ego. And even that's not a true separation. It's an illusion because you can't be separate, right? If you want to go really like super philosophical. I made assumptions this week and had to apologize to a coworker. <clears throat> Excuse me, that was really good of you to apologize. A lot of people don't. Everyone on here is intuitive to some degree. Okay, so if you're intuitive, you're going to feel things coming from other people. A good lesson, yeah. You've got to check out your perceptions. Because our assumptions about what you're feeling are generally wrong. Because they're coming through a filter of our own experiences. Okay, so ask. If you're not comfortable asking, it's probably not someone you should be worried about anyway. It takes practice to ask, too. Because it's intimate, right? And you have to ask and be willing. Where do soul contracts fit in? Do you believe in soul contracts? Uh, I'm finding when I do things like this now, it's getting easier to recognize. Um, I do believe in soul contracts to some degree. I also believe that we have a choice to break them. I think we have agreements with people. You know, you find those people who you have an instant connection to, and you just have a sense that something deeper is happening between your interactions, whether they're positive or negative. Um, but I also think ultimately we have free will. So even if before we're born, and I don't know, but let me just hypothesize. If we're, before we're born, if we make a contract that we're going to meet with, up with another soul, we're going to play out a scenario. At the end of the day, we still have free will to change our mind. A soul contract is the, the assumption that before we're born, we plan out certain events and experiences as learning opportunities 
to work out karma or just to learn things and experience certain things. So <clears throat> you run across someone in your life and you feel an instant connection. Past life contracts we've taken, things. Um, so, I, you know, none of us really know any of that for 100%. But let's say it's true and I've definitely felt that connection to someone that was so strong. I felt like I'd known them for eons. Um, I, I think we still have the choice to break a contract. Because ultimately, we're all the same. Oh, I think my husband and I have one. I know I have free will to break it, but I'm sticking it out. Some are good, yeah. Ew, I didn't pick well if that's the case. <laughs> Learning major lessons, yeah. <clears throat> so that's a theory. I think there's some validity to it. But take it back a step and we're not separate. So even if you have what you would call a soul contract between someone that you're working things out and you're learning from, they're you. You're your parents, your parents are you. You're all parts of the same whole playing out scenarios for whatever reason. For learning, for just sheer experience. With understanding, I've canceled soul contracts or have rewritten them. Playing out the human experience, yeah. Which we always have a choice in. And please understand, we're playing those scenarios out with ourselves. We're all one. We're all parts of a whole in different bodies. But when you can get to a place of compassion and feel that connection to other people who are going through their own miserable things and playing out their own lives... Rewriting them. Yeah, you can rewrite them. You can break them. You can rewrite them. We have free will. Ultimately, for me, free will is the most important thing. We have free will. Someone can torture my body and murder it, but they cannot take my, away my connection to God. What makes me ask is that I was born into very bad parenting. A lot of people are born into severe parenting. I worked for years in Child Protective Services, so... I've probably seen it all firsthand. Um, and that can be a pretty rich learning ground. A rich learning ground, if you can see it that way. It makes you sad. <clears throat> so that would be worth exploring. Uh, if it's pretty severe parenting, you probably want to explore that with a therapist. Because that can get pretty heavy. Ultimately, you can move through that and get some really good things out of it. Yeah, okay, good. If it's still making you sad, there's still work to do, though. I would just suggest that. Yeah, it's not easy. It can lead to compassion with time. Yep. Honor your grief process, uh, but don't let that be the defining factor of your life. It's other bad parenting that bothers you. If it's still, but that's what I'm saying. If it still bothers you, there's still work to do. Like, after years in child protection, it would be easy to hate people. But here's what I know. Even the people who do the worst abuse, they didn't wake up that morning planning it out. There's very few true sociopaths in the world who plan out their vicious things. That that's a minority. Unfortunately, that's who we hear about, so we think it's a lot of people plan out that horribleness, but they don't. I may have met one parent who was a true sociopath that did their things in a calculated um in a calculated planned manner. Most parents snap. Something sends them over the emotional edge. They had shitty parenting of their own that they weren't past. They didn't have any parenting skills. They thought what they were doing was the right thing to do, and it was horribly wrong. Uh, so emotional snapping. And th these are, I'm talking about parents who did things that led to their children's deaths. Most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, they didn't mean it. They didn't plan it. It happened. It was horrible. 
and it's inexcusable and consequences still have to be delivered. But you can deliver consequences with love or you can deliver them with hate. Consequences are a fact in our world. If you do something horrible, there are going to be consequences to your soul and to your physical body and your material life. There's going to be consequences for that, but you can deliver them with love. A lot of people I had to file court cases on. A lot of people I testified against. But you can testify from a place of compassion. You can understand that factors led up to it. You're all oh, good. Good, good. I'm glad it's helpful. You can understand that factors led up to that moment in time where a horror and a tragedy occurred. But if I hate that parent, if I testify in court with an attitude of, I'm going to get you, you son of a bitch, that hurts me. Yes, very much love to you. You're in like a circle of compassion right here, Missy. <laughs> There's a lot of love on this broadcast all the time, every day. <laughs> okay, does that make sense to you? We don't know another person's story. And to try to think about it. That, yeah. And the, so abusive and neglectful relationships, it doesn't mean you stay. Same with domestic violence. You don't stay with people who are hurting you. But you can leave with an attitude of compassion, which saves your own soul. Hatred toward them doesn't change, doesn't hurt them, doesn't change them. It hurts you. It changes you for the worse. And it takes a while to get to the place of compassion. So please don't hear me saying that you should leave and be all lovey about it. Hashtag circle of compassion. <laughs> you know, you're going to go through your anger. You're going to go through your sadness. And ultimately you can come to a place of, so you're probably a pretty strong soul if you were able to hit the road at 15. Understanding doesn't mean no consequences. There are still consequences. But you move through your grief, you move through your anger, you come back to a place of compassion, and that's where you live your life. Because we don't know why they did what they did. None of us do. God forgive them, they know not what they do. Because we don't. We've all, we've all made mistakes. We've all had moments of like, what in the hell was I thinking? What the hell was I thinking? Holding on to anger is bad for you. Yes, it's bad for your body. It's bad for your soul. Set that free so you can be free. Honor your anger. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's a group effort. Yeah. Yeah. Honor your negative emotions as they're flowing through. Knowing that when your work is done, you will be comfortably sitting in a place of compassion. It may always give you a little twinge and you may always wish things could be different. It takes a village. Yes, it takes a village to heal ourselves. And I'm definitely no guru. Because they don't love themselves. People don't love their children because they don't love themselves. You can't give what you don't have to give. And it doesn't matter. I worked with addicts for years and the worst part of their was their recovery process was recognizing how over and over they had abandoned their children for their drug. Oh, there's grit behind me. Um, people will sell their kids for drugs, literally. And then that makes recovery harder, if not impossible. Your mom was a crack addict. Yeah. Yeah, so I hear ya. You don't have to go it alone, ever. You left at 16. Yeah. So addicts, well, hopefully you're not still swimming up that river. Oh, yeah. Okay, so yeah, it makes us do... Oops, she's stuck in the chair. Hold on. Oh, oh she got it. I gotta trim her nails. Uh, so people will sell their kids for drugs. They'll sell their soul for drugs. Um, they absolutely cannot put their children and families first in the midst of an addiction. It's not possible. It just isn't. 
and it's not about any of the people around them. Yay, free! But remember that if there's still triggers going on, investigate it further for your own sake. Okay, so every loving thought is true. Celebrate, celebrate. Um, everything else is an appeal for healing. Free will. Yep. It's very important to me, Michelle. It's like one of my highest values. Freedom is my highest value. Well, stick around, honey. <laughs> you just have to get old. <laughs> you already have it. You already have it. You already have it. It's already there within you. It's already there. It's already there. Just open the door and express it. Um, every loving thought is true. And that's the only truth there is. And anything else is a story. Well, it's because you're not done with it. And that's okay. Life's the education, right? have your glasses <laughs> you're fine you should see my horoscope for today oh my god right after you signed up for desire map love you too love you too you're a healer for the damage probably probably intuitive and empathic and you probably need to find someone to study that with yeah yeah it, it happens it's okay. It's a good thing. Um, the Desire Map Workshop is what we're doing right now. And what we did for with Linda the other day. It's, it's figuring out where the hot spots still are and coaching our way through it. Our trauma is our work. Yes. Your trauma is your work. There's a lot of book recommendations you'll get here, or you can go to the Catch channel, catch.me forward slash Michelle Wolf 11. It's the same, catch.me forward slash and my handle. Periscope and Twitter are the same. There's a lot of recordings, especially the last couple of weeks. Um, those might be a good resource for you if you feel like watching them, and then you can fast forward through the you can fast forward through my introductory stuff that I babble about. If you're setting a goal or you've set a goal and you're not getting there or you're trying to maintain an emotion and you can't, there's work to do. <laughs> you're slow. <laughs> the comments go quick. And a lot of times you just can't keep track. I can't keep track of them all sometimes. We are chatty today. <laughs> if you believe that an appeal for help is something else, you will react to something else. Beware your story. Beware the story that you tell. The story is the only place of control that you have. The story that you tell yourself. So for abusive parents is, my parents were abusive, period. And the story around all of that is your point of control. So kids respond to abuse differently. Some kids respond with this sense of indignation of like, even as small kids, three and four or five years old, they have a sense of indignation, some of them. And they're like, who the hell do they think they are? <laughs> Whooping on me. <laughs> Yeah, so he has a different road than you. Kids handle it differently. Some are like, oh, hell no. And others like, I must be a piece of shit for them to act like that. Oh, he became a drug addict. Yeah, so he's not dealing with this stuff. The Desire Map helps you rewrite the story that you tell yourself. Yeah, because it's discovering what the story is in the first place. If you're living in the middle of a story, you can't see it. That's the joy of a group experience is that other people can mirror back to you what your story is. When you know what your story is, you can change it. it may take a while, 
but you can change it. If you tell you know what your story's about, you can't change it because you can't see it. Yes. Yeah, there's a workshop coming up. Uh, the tickets are on sale for another week. You can go there and read about it if you feel drawn. Oops, I wrote a bunch of garbage underneath. Oh, I wrote that email address down from the lovely Tarot Life Coach, whose name escapes me at the moment. Five weeks of awesome dot eventbrite dot com. Your brother became a cop. He was able to leave, but he was able to leave because you did. Uh, and just to let you know, I've worked with cops since 1996, and a lot of them are deeply afraid. Which is why they go into law enforcement to begin with. And a lot of them are very sensitive and intuitive. So did dads. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's a butthole. <laughs> Would you not exchange your fears for truth if the exchange is yours for the asking? All you have to do is ask to get help choosing love instead of fear, to approach life through love instead of fear. All you have to do is ask. All you have to do is say, help me. All you have to do is say, I'm willing to see the world differently. I'm willing to see the incidents of my parents being abusive differently through different eyes. Just try it on. See what happens. You've got nothing to lose. You can always go back to where you are today. And this is for everybody. You know, I'm not. You can always pick your pain back up. But you have the choice every day to experiment living without it. Because it's just, it's a story. And our stories are changeable every single day. Okay. That's all I have for today. Um, so, book giveaway Monday. Desire Map Workshop ticket sales end October 10th. Oh, yeah, I'm a Desire Map facilitator. And more. The drug addict baby daddy was worse than parents. Yeah. Yep. So, there you go. Um, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you for coming, as always. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for the beautiful, beautiful hearts. Uh, the color combinations today are great. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Stop on by anytime. <laughs> you can watch cats playing in the background. <laughs> Nice to meet you, Rose. What a beautiful name. You're welcome. It's her class that the web address is showing. Yeah. I'll show you one more time. It involves essential oils, too. Five weeks of awesome dot event bright dot com. So much gratitude to everyone. Such honesty. Good stuff today. Yeah. Oh, Byron Katie. Oh. Check out Byron Katie, uh, the work dot com or dot org. Yeah, Byron Katie's the best on picking apart your story, telling yourself a different story, and it's all free. I'm not free. Her stuff is free. <laughs> the work dot org or the work dot com. Byron Katie, B Y R O N K A T I E. Uh, Linda, if you go on YouTube and Google uh, or uh, enter in the search bar Byron Katie, you're welcome. You'll find tons of videos watching her in action. I got to meet her once, and I about fell over. Thank you, Jana. I just about fell over from the energy that comes out of that woman. Like, to make eye contact with that woman is, it just will knock your socks off, even on video. And then to meet her in person, it's just almost overwhelming. I just cried. I just stood right in front of her and cried. 
tons of healing. Yep. It's a good resource. Okay. I'm going to go. Uh, I think the rain's coming back. It's getting darker. We still have a little hurricane um, fallout, even as high up as we are. We're still getting a lot of rain. So, I will see you tomorrow. Yay, sun! Yeah, you guys have been getting the rain, too, right? Um, see you tomorrow for the book giveaway. Yeah. <laughs> Don't float away. <laughs> Don't float away. All right. Thank you for coming. Come back and see us tomorrow. Bye.